Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm glad to be here today on the, at the No Name Conf with you. Uh, unfortunately, still online. So this year is, is uh, not possible to, to be physically present with you. Of course, easier for the logistics. Uh, let's hope for, for better in the next year. Uh, as Vlad mentioned, I'll talk about the uh, Polish, and not only incidents, but also the overall the uh, cybersecurity threat landscape, let's say so, in the country. And um, for you to understand why I will be talking about Poland so on a Ukrainian event, uh, a little bit info about myself. So basically, the answer is straightforward. Uh, because I'm a Ukrainian who's been living for the last six years in Poland, and uh, because I have connection to both countries and both uh, business sectors, uh, I try wherever it's possible to connect the dots and uh, facilitate some knowledge sharing between the countries. And since uh, for the last three and a half years, as Vlad mentioned as well, I'm uh, participating in this endeavor with BSG, British Security Group. Uh, I think it's uh, no wonder that I'm uh, with this mission of knowledge sharing between the uh, upset communities of uh, Ukraine, Poland, and whoever is else present here. No wonder I'm here with this talk. Um, logically, it would be probably to start with some overview of Poland. From the other side, it's pretty difficult and probably not thankful uh, attempt to do some summary of a country in a couple of minutes. Uh, even look for something much more simpler, right? like human height. We, it's a known fact that human height is 1 meter 70, but when you talk with someone, most probably not 1 meter 70, there could be uh, actually the reason why he or she would not agree because of own experience. And on the people, I think the airlines strongly disagree with these statistics. To my feeling, uh, the airlines strongly believe that uh, average height is 150, actually, looking at the air, uh, space they have in the aircrafts. But jokes apart, I'll try to, to give you some, uh, uh, let's say, considerations that my opinion would help you to understand what will be discussed later. But they are strongly my private opinion and, uh, uh, of course, advised. So for you to remember this, not to treat this as a golden source of truth, I have this jokey slide uh, while I'll be talking uh, of uh, Polish uh, city translations, for like literal translations. Of course, uh, they are not perceived like that, but if you look at the words, they are like that. So Poland, Poland is a big country. It's like in the top 10 in Europe uh, by population and by territory. It was even bigger, sometimes much bigger in history, but history was no, not too kind to Poland. And during the last four stop date, which was World War II, it shrinked, it moved to, or shifted to, to the West. Population also was mishmashed and, and deported uh, in some territories. And eventually Poland uh, was occupied by the Soviets. But this series of tragic events actually gave some uh, unique chance to the country because afterwards it became a country with a single nation, country with single culture, language, uh, religion, and so on. And the, I think it's helped later when they ran away from communists and joined the EU, one of the first. But so this similarity, it actually gives uh, um, birth, or I would say it, it, it causes some patterned behavior in the society, in my opinion. And of course, patterns is good for, for attackers, right? Because you know what to, to expect from the people or predict their behavior. Despite this unity, there are still things that split poles apart. For example, the traditional views versus liberal views, the right views on politics versus centric views on politics. And this clash gives some hot topics still in the society, like um, attitude to abortion, attitude to sexual minorities, attitude to church, and, and so on. And of course, all those uh, hot topics or weak points uh, are used by attackers or uh, fraudsters to either polarize this uh, society or to cause some emotions, whatever is needed for the successful attack. Okay, then um, I would say that on average, uh, Polish people are rather you know, close or uh, even suspicious to someone who is not in the inner circle of their trust. And actually, you would say good for security, right? Zero trust in blood. But from the other side, the curiosity doesn't go away. And if you can't get open information, you try to look through the loophole, right? What's happening at your neighbor. So this gives some demand for gossip or rumor type of news, I would say, or even you know, some media uh, content. Uh, people here are a little bit negative thinking. There's even the Polish proverb, which says, if you don't complain, you don't leave. So if you want to gain someone's trust, probably you should find for something similar or common to complain about, and you can kind of gain the trust quickly in this way. And also people are pretty pragmatic about money. So if you want to trigger the 
uh, attention, I don't know, to, 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 to encourage some actions, you probably should appeal to this efficiency. Uh, it will mostly work. I even joke sometimes that the most uh, popular social network in Poland is uh, OLX, so the place where people buy and sell things. And uh, on a serious note, uh, despite huge investment from European Union, Pol Pol Poland is still uh, on the lower side in terms of GDP per capita, so it's kind of low-cost location for Europe. And together with the great talent, human talent here, it uh, made a good basis to become a, a service location. So business processes are outsourced here, IT is outsourced here, shared service uh, centers are created here. So this all is uh, actually very much influenced on the uh, economics in the first and then the society as well, it's li at least in the cities where those services are um, aggregated. So service economy, uh, closed uh, mindset, probably no wonder you would expect that there should be interest in uh, security, right, uh, overall. And, and yes, indeed, and on this slide, I'll uh, actually, I'm showing you the uh, ecosystem, I would say, of, of the information security or application even security. The three um, uh, icons on the left, uh, these are the media sources for the application or information security and use. Nibisfeching, Sikurak, and Zofana, Chechenstrona. Actually, they're pretty popular. I have to say, I was uh, even surprised to see the number of subscribers. Nibisfeching, which is most popular, it has more than 100,000, uh, 140,000 people currently uh, as subscribers, a huge audience. Of course, OWASP is also a present and active organization, but it's more like professional uh, audience. I don't enumerate here numerous uh, commercial firms that uh, are acting in this uh, um, territory, as well as BSG, mine company. But there is the uh, umbrella that unites them, this uh, cyber cluster, cyber made in Poland. So for those who are curious, you can just um, uh, take it from there and research yourself. And I put a couple of labels of uh, big events here. That's not complete list, uh, um, but they survived at least uh, the pandemics. And actually, the conference will be happening next week also in online format. So for those of you who are curious, you could, could join it and listen to what people say, uh, talked about in Poland about, uh, in respect of security. Uh, okay, that was professional community. What about the broader, broader uh, audience? Uh, of course, uh, as everywhere right now, some episodes and films or series are happening that are connected with hacking or technology. There was even a, a whole speech on the Confidence Conference about that, uh, showing these bloopers where someone was typing email in the Microsoft Paint or someone was dumping the data from mobile phone and then it turned out that this is actually NMAP, so it doesn't dump data and uh, other, other mistakes like that. But there is one thing, uh, one book I'm mentioning because it's pretty realistic. I mean, it's still fiction, but it's realistic in its descriptions and it shows and gives good overview of potential attack scenarios for the society. Uh, this is the hidden web or uh, Krita Sheich. Jakub Shumalek. Of course, the it's a pity that it doesn't uh, has uh, doesn't have an English version yet. At least uh, the last time I checked. And by the way, as well as those media I mentioned, they're in Polish, not because people don't speak English, but because probably that's the kind of local identification. Uh, so, uh, in case uh, someone of you will need more information and is in Polish, uh, so it's a kind of blogger for you. Please reach out to me. I'll try to help. But anyway, the book describes uh, these uh, attack scenarios. And they, globally, we see it happening. The attack on critical infrastructure, the political impact on elections, the personal uh, level crime using the uh, cryptocurrency and the dark net and so on. Interestingly enough, um, the book doesn't mention ransom as, as such, but it describes all its elements. So I don't know if it's on purpose or it's just uh, was when the book was written, it was not so popular. Anyways, let's see how those scenarios, which, which are on your screen, how they, uh, or if they actually happened in reality during, I, I've taken the last past year for, for my research of the incidents. So let's see what happened during the past year and how it uh, correlates to, to this fiction piece. Um, so I, I've split the incidents to three parts, state level, business level, and personal uh, fraud or mass sector. Uh, and uh, before we start, I have to say that I've used the public sources for, for this research. So no insider information. And for this reason, I doubt if these are really the largest incidents, maybe largest state actually uh, unpublic, uh, but for sure it was like loudest incidents, those that people talked about in media and between themselves. 
So let's get, get started. First uh, state, state level. And I'll start with, with the real attack. Uh, so uh, I'll start from the end. Right now it's known that this is uh, done by a group that is called Ghostwriter, a uh, group of hackers, probably, which for sure are attributed to Russia and probably even have connections with uh, Fancy Bear or Sandworm. Uh, the main goal of them is actually manipulation or disinformation. The target territory, this is the close to Russia countries like Poland and Baltic states. And what they do, they uh, find their victims uh, in uh, uh, people uh, among people who are known, like politicians usually. They take over their accounts and then either do some misinformation through their accounts or do the manipulation by taking some data from the accounts and publishing. And uh, uh, in the end, luckily, the Secret Service of Poland uh, got hold of it. Uh, they really started treating it seriously after actually a year and a half of happenings. And now uh, they investigated, there was more, were more than 4,000 people on the list of uh, victims in Poland. And uh, assumedly, probably several hundreds of them were hacked. In media, there were a dozen or maybe up to 20 uh, accounts that leaked of something or were hacked and something was happening with them. And uh, from technical perspective, it was not sophisticated. Usually it was due to uh, bad security settings of the accounts of the mailbox, mainly. Uh, the uh, manipulation was either small, like just uh, undermining trust in some concept. For example, the woman who was uh, uh, supporting the women strike, uh, her account, this Marlena Malang, her account was hacked. Or with, as it happened with the recent one, Michal Dvorak, minister of the government, uh, he he was used, and actually uh, the content from his mailbox, which some probably are true, some are fake, were used for uh, Belarusian propaganda. So Lukashenko used it to prove that Poland had the leading role in uh, Belarusian op opposition protests uh, last year and this year, mostly last year. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, actually what was happening in the politics. No real... Uh, Highly confidential data leaked to public, in my opinion, at least from what I know. We don't know what leaked to the hands of the uh, of the attackers, but of course, this uh, manipulation in information area it happened and it happened a lot. Um, what's next? Next, I will talk about several uh, incidents which are not a uh, result of attack as such, targeted attack. Rather, it's a result of some design flaws or some like UKR due diligence in the state sector. First uh, are the examples I gathered throughout PESEL. And first, uh, what is PESEL, right? It's the uh, general registry, identification registry of people, something like social security number in the United States. And by, by design in this meeting, it's nothing wrong with that, right? The country has to somehow identify all its citizens and uh, guests. As long as it's used as identifier, it's fine. But the issue is that it's often used as a authentication or even authorization mean. And then the, the, the issues happen because even though it seems that PESOL is something private that only you know, but in reality, it's in a lot of places and it's not that difficult to get someone's PESOL if you, if, you, if you need to. So it's not a secret. Um, there are, it's pretty common that uh, uh, some files are encrypted and PESOL is used as a password. The example which you see here on the left is actually the um, uh, COVID test results that were stored in a common folder and each file was just encrypted by PESOL. Actually, Nibisvechnik took, took, took this information and proved that knowing that the password is PESOL, you can break it in 50 seconds on a common uh, laptop. So no, no rocket science here. And, and that was in the incident. Also, it's a, it's a big question if you can do something uh, um, wrong with PESEL, like take a loan, for example. And the answer is yes, unfortunately, although not uh, very often. But there are some services, not banks, usually banks do it more thorough, but some services that uh, in favor of you know, usability and to gain uh, clients do it uh, simplified to a bad extent. So like you provide the pestle, you get the loan. If it's someone else's pestle, then you get the loan, someone else owes money. It's like obviously not good. Also, there's a screenshot here. Uh, there was an attack um, which was caused by uh, ability to produce a duplicate, sim duplicate, just knowing the pestle and the phone number of a person, calling the support and saying, okay, I've lost my sim card. That's my pestle. That's the ID of the new card. Please link it to my phone number. You take over the phone number, you take control over the accounts that link to this phone number. And that happened. So that's reality. And one funny case, well, funny for us, probably not for the poor guy, 
who discovered that he has extra kit in his profile at the social fund. And of course, again, the root cause, because we talk about Tesla, was the typo. So when his kit was, uh, has some medical treatment, when the uh, results were entered in the system, they had a typo in the pestle. And in this way, the foreign, let's say, to this person kid was attached to his profile. Uh, I think this guy spent a lot, I know that the person spent a lot of time to uh, clean this up. It took more than two months, but we don't know how much more hours he spent explaining to his wife why he has the third kid on his account. Uh, hopefully, he managed to resolve that as well. Okay, that was the identification part, but of course there are means for two means uh, that were designed to authenticate. And in Poland, uh, it's not one uh, something like DIA. The, there are several ways to uh, authenticate yourself at uh, state level or state digital services. First, you have the trusted profile, profiles of money. This is a kind of centralized uh, directory of users, but in order to have this account, you have to do a physical verification of yourself, either through the municipality or uh, it can be an identity provider like a bank that you use uh, to log into this profile. Profile. Then you can use also the true electronic signature, which is also uh, when created requires verification of a person. And there is also the new ID documents, which have chips in it, and some other ways for for uh, authentication. Each channel is good, but you feel probably that because there are many of them, there can be a collision. And actually, there is a vulnerability and a collision between them, especially in the, or I would say, even in the trusted profile itself, because as I mentioned, you can have uh, the credentials or use the identity provider. The issue is, or the behavior is such that if you have several accounts in several banks, as you see here on this screen, there are several banks, right? And um, uh, all, all will be valid at the same time. One will be active, but all will be valid. And uh, you can choose which one is active. And the issue is that when you choose a different one as active, the previous one is only notified, but not requ required to authorize this action. If you're lucky, you will notice the notification. If you're not lucky, probably your account will be taken over uh, silently. I mean, not noticed. An account here means trusted profile, which gives access to all your text data, medical data, and overall, the, everything the state knows about you basically is, is, is accessible with this uh, account really powerful. And if you will look uh, um, attentively to these icons on the right, you'll see one which is called Envelope. Uh, probably didn't hear about such a bank because it's not a bank, it's a post office. And actually the incident that happened, the known incident happened through Envelope because post office does not verify your account such in such a good manner as banks do. So usually you imagine the post office, right? And Poland is not, 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 not better than Ukraine. So some maybe old woman sitting behind the counter you come and say, okay, this is my pestle. I want to verify my bank uh, internet account. Probably she even doesn't really know what this is. Okay, pestle, pestle is pestle, uh, mark, tick mark, it's done. So yeah, it's, um, it's um, let's say, risk here by design. Um, uh, another thing, interesting thing that was actually is happening this year in Poland is the uh, population census. First, it is mandatory. So you already feel the pain, right? It's like saying that elections are mandatory. Kind of nonsense, but it is. And if you don't provide your information in the census, e e even if you're not a citizen, if you just live in Poland, so the criteria is living here, uh, you may get a fine. Fine, fine is up to $1,500, so pretty, pretty significant. And um, there are two ways to submit information online and through a person who is called Rachmistrz, account master. With the online piece, uh, from the security leakage perspective, there was none so far re re recorded or reported. But from the other side, as yesterday in his interview, Daniel Mister told that if someone gathers a centralized, centralized uh, database of something, he is doing it for, for, for the other actor who will steal it later. So who knows, maybe these census results will still be stolen somewhere in time. Not, not yet, luckily. And here, the only thing that uh, was interesting is by design is that you could authenticate yourself with PASL again, and some uh, additional information, which is not difficult to find, like date of birth. And you will log in into the census. Actually, you can provide them the, the data. Of course, you don't get access to any data through such channel. You can just provide false data, which probably makes no sense. But the other interesting um, uh, consequences that you can actually block these sensors for the person. So if you have some neighbors who some, uh, listen to loud music at night and you know their pestle, you just log in and start entering their sensors and don't finish it, never. 
And actually, there is no mechanism to regain control over this online submission. It, it just was, was not designed. So the only way is left for them is to go to Rachmist, which probably they will not do because it's, it's difficult. So you can uh, spoil a, a bit their mood. And also, interesting thing is that because uh, uh, the PESL requires validation, there is an endpoint at the backend that validates PESLs, and it's uh, publicly available. Of course, as I mentioned, it's not a big secret. I mean, you can find PESLs to other channels as well, but having a, um, a state-owned public PESL validator, which enables your PESL enumeration, I think it's not a good idea as well. And uh, the other channel, which is uh, getting or fetching the information by, by human, human, by this count master, this gave birth, of course, to some fraud uh, based on that. Imagine you get this uh, SMS like on the screen. Uh, Hi, I'm your account master. Please call me uh, this number you call. And then you started to be asked questions, which is expected, right, about your private information, because that's what census does. Um, how to check if this person is really account master. So there was even an instruction how to do it, but you feel, feel the pain, right? So there were cases of, of the fraud based on this, obviously. And there were more incidents at state level. Some of them are on the screen. I will not go into the details of them because uh, probably I'll be out of time if I will do so. Just as a, as a summary. Summary is that on the state level, uh, the security is not sufficient uh, of the state services. Probably because the engineers are underpaid, the technologies are obsolete, lack of ownership as always in the state-owned uh, um, institutions. Uh, but well, that house is leaking as in the Elvis Presley song. I think uh, if Kors, Korson is looking uh, currently at my presentation, he, he would like this uh, conclusion because it's pretty the same as in Ukraine, I guess. And one last example I have here, it's more from the commercial world, but it also happened with the city. The city of Ashwensem was ransomed. They had some servers with geodesy information, it was encrypted, and they were asked for ransom. They had to announce a tender. I mean, city probably cannot pay ransom officially. So they announced tender, some company won, tender for decrypting the data. And no one never told how it was decrypted. So there's a chance that the company just paid the ransom to, 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 the, um, to the attackers. And so the sad fact is that actually the money for that, and you see this 620,000 zlotys, it was taken from the other budget line, which was uh, intended for road construction. So poor citizens, citizens of uh, Ashwensen, they paid for the ransom instead of paying for the, for the road, for the new road. So ransom is probably a good connector from the state level to the uh, business level. The uh, known case, uh, it was in English uh, language media, that's why it's known. It's a actually known company producing the uh, cyberpunk and the Witcher games. It was ransomed. Yesterday, Oksana talked about it in, her, uh, in more details in her presentation. I wanted to provide some basic info, but I think I'll skip because anyway, you can uh, listen to her presentation if, you, if you're interested and get more details. There was another company, a game company that was hacked. It's Margonem. The game is pretty old, but still it's, uh, it has a decent number of users. But even from this screenshot from the forum, you see it's uh, kind of old, old style. Uh, the uh, incident happened to, through um, Mm, breaking into the admin panel, so it's not ransom, it's probably the just, uh, again, the uh, all, uh, admin panel probably is pretty old, uh, as the game is. And some private data leaked or potentially leaked. The company had to inform the users. Actually, I wanted to say that uh, in business sector, companies do inform people about data breaches, which that is required, or potentially in data breaches, that is required by GPR, and they really follow this. Um, a requirement. But the funny thing is then when they informed this in this uh, SMS uh, which you see on the screen, they made a, an error in this URL shortener and they added an extra char to the domain name. So when people actually click the link, whoever clicked, maybe some wise people do not click links in the SMS, but still, they actually landed on a fake uh, website which uh, raised concerns significantly because, well, <laughs> it, uh, it looked actually as a second attack uh, or the attack itself, itself instead of just informing the, about potential breach. There was one case where it kind of seemed like a supply chain and some people already pull, pull, pulled out the popcorn to watch it uh, growing. Uh, the company is a Hungarian though, there are some, but it supplies software for banks, including Polish banks. And one of its uh, uh, servers, the test servers was hacked uh, and theoretically, the attacker could inject malicious code or version into the build, in the CICD 
chain and then it could be propagated to the banks using it. But everything ended up happily to users because it was just a hack for the crypto mining. So someone tried to, to mine coins uh, on this server and that, that was all. The next case is not that happy. I mean, uh, here the uh, leak of personal information did happen. Tauron is a supplier of uh, electricity, one of the two biggest uh, players on the Polish market. And uh, private data and call records leaked, uh, pretty, pretty uh, big number of them. You see the screenshot of a folder that had numerous uh, subfolders in it. But this story is interesting. It's kind of a thriller. Uh, you see the end of this story, or almost the end, right? This picture of the guy being captured by police, that's, uh, that's how it ended. Uh, but the guy uh, actually looks like he's not that evil. He, according to his story, he was who's telling it uh, later in the uh, in the media, and that he got attacked by this server. It's funny to hear, but yeah, the server scanned his his IP. Probably the server was hacked before, because why should the server scan? It? And he uh, he had been a kind of engineer, so he went on this server, saw the uh, folder without any um, access protection, saw a lot of information there, and put it downloading and went to a party. He got back from the party, probably a bit drunk or not a bit drunk, saw that he actually downloaded lots of private information of Tauron users. He called Tauron and asked to close the gap, and they kind of didn't believe him. Maybe he was not too firm, sounding not too firm at this point of time. Uh, he got angry with this um, attitude and uh, wrote an email with uh, demanding some ransom, uh, or he would publish the data. Then in the morning when he woke up sober, he realized he did something wrong, but before he could do something with it, actually, police knocked at his, at his door. Uh, but yeah, actually, he was let go because probably it was for Tauron to problematic to sue him because then they would have to reveal the details why their server was uh, keeping the information without uh, access protection. And actually, they did reveal some information. It turned out that this was not managed by them, but by the third party. And the third party were two small companies. Uh, doing the call center for services for them. It's an open question, why did they choose? A big a national wide player chose some small companies for doing some services. But let's call it just a bad vendor management practices, not to think more uh, behind it. And uh, probably Tauron will fix this later on, not to uh, face such incidents. And the last slide is a couple of incidents happened in the healthcare industry. Obviously, a lot, uh, recent couple of years, the attention to healthcare is increased and to their services and remote, um, even remote medicine, and of course, the remote uh, downloading of results. So a lot of situations about leak, uh, the, the test results or some diagnosis leaked, like in this case, again, uh, unprotected folder on the server. And actually, even worse, it was indexed by Google. So it took some time for Google to clean up, oh, not for Google, but for them to realize and to, 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 to uh, request the cleanup of uh, the medical data, which were even available on the, on the internet uh, through Google. And the second example is that the error that the system provided was purpose. It uh, revealed some endpoints and it uh, unluckily turned out that the endpoints are without authentication and they leaked Okay, again, medical results and actually uh, healthcare data of, of people. So uh, the conclusion is here that if the industry experiences a boom in, in, in a demand, it should also experience similar or even higher uh, increase of attention to security. Otherwise, uh, inevitably, uh, the um, incidents will start happening. Okay, and personal. Personal fraud. The most... Uh, even here, it's not known, but probably the largest in terms of impact was the oil leak scam. Uh, thousands of people impacted, and I've seen information that more than one and a half million lot is actually stolen for, during this uh, um, attack. And it's not, it's not even an attack, probably a series of attacks, because it was a distributed network behind it, uh, not no single player. It was a single uh, point of automation. There is a classic scam group that actually provided automation of bots and landing pages that are mimicking the um, shops, in this case, oil leaks. Uh, and it can be rented, so probably even you could rent a bot for yourself and try to uh, fraud someone. Um, uh, the logic of the deck was very similar always. Someone showed interest into your uh, item that you're selling on oil leaks. He said, okay, I'm buying. And then he's saying, okay, uh, oil leaks will send you a link right now. 
that you should use to get your money because they message me that they will do this to you. And then a person gets a link, everything looks like a leaks, but in reality, it starts asking you uh, secret information, not only credit card number, but also CVV. I've seen cases of being asked date of birth, uh, mother maiden name, and so on. And I'm actually curious why people do not um, see these red flags, that it shouldn't be happening, right? If you want to get money, you don't have to provide the data which actually needs to be uh, available to spend money. But a lot of people are probably just impatient to get their money. They wanted to do everything just to get the uh, uh, the money for the good they, they wanted to sell. Uh, as I mentioned, a real uh, big scale of fraud. Uh, all the banks were uh, alerting that uh, this is happening. The release itself was alerting that it's happening. But probably to, uh, during the half a year, Poland was like shaked by this by this attack. Uh, there were smaller attacks. One is uh, actually it's probably connected with this ghostwriter. So on the personal side, it looked like a you know, phishing for for your email accounts and pretty straightforward, but also pretty efficient, effective. Uh, something saying that the privacy terms updated. Click now, or otherwise you will not be able to use your mail account. People clicked, and yeah, they they were losing the accounts. It's not only uh, virtual Poland, which is Wupe. But I mentioned it specifically because it's the largest, uh, let's say, Polish uh, developed mail provider, something like Ukrainet in Ukraine. And a lot of politician accounts, actually, which were hacked, they were hacked through personal mails, mailboxes on this WUPE uh, mail service. And the last slide, uh, I decided to just combine it with the visualization in one slide, but tell you in different stories. Mostly they are about receiving some. Uh, your information that requires you to act soon, uh, otherwise you'll be in trouble. For example, you have like small amount of overdue, but if you don't uh, close it, then your electricity will be cut off or your parcel will not be delivered. For you, it seems like, okay, I pay this even less than a zloty quickly and I get right to, rid of the problem. Ooh, typical of social engineering uh, methods. And uh, yeah, of course, then the, uh, the link is crafted. Uh, more interesting, more uh, uh, cases when the... Uh, you got calls. Actually, calls were from the number that uh, that really kind of belonged to the bank. So the number was spoofed. And the person who was calling you acted like a security department specialist. He was getting your trust because he kind of uh, made, made it possible for you to avoid a fake transaction. But in the end, his conclusion was that you have a virus in your device. You have to install something, something like TeamViewer. And through this uh, then application, you actually your device was... Uh, hacked the, the control taken over and your uh, account used for the malicious purposes, I mean, bank account. Uh, so that was pretty uh, wide scale, uh, this info line scam, let's say so. And there was one interesting corner case when there was a blackmailing of entrepreneurs. And why it's known that it's entrepreneurs? Because uh, they, are, they are mail boxes which are in the company uh, registry uh, were used. And the message was like, we have some uh, information or even some pictures of you doing something not good with children. Uh, I mean, of pedophilia kind of uh, um, content. And if you don't pay on ransom, we will publish it. And, and I just think uh, normally people would ignore this, right? Because normally they don't have nothing to do with pedophilia. But if, if this was happening, probably there was a corner cases when not numerous, hopefully victims, but uh, that are not clean in this context. They uh, prefer to pay rather than to be, uh, you know, uh, compromised. And anyway, interesting fact, it's not vis visible here, but uh, there were cases where the such messages, SMS, uh, were coming from non-Polish numbers. Ukrainians, I've seen Ukrainian numbers, uh, Baltic countries, like uh, from Belarus as well. I just wonder if you have such a SMS from, from a no number which is not your country, why would you click on something like this? But people clicked, obviously. And by the way, what's interesting, uh, from time to time, such uh, uh, at hacker groups, uh, it's probably too loud word because usually it's a, a small scale hacking uh, for a particular group of people, they are caught by police. So I would say probably once in a month, I see news that some group was revealed that were sending this uh, SMS and a picture of, you know, a bed with a lot of uh, phone, mobile phone um, phones lie, uh, lying on the bed connected with some with some cables. Okay, so that's probably it in terms of overview of the incidents. But I have a couple of more slides to 
fulfill the uh, picture. Uh, one is about what the state doing about it, uh, cyber police. Uh, the cyber police exists for, for years. But this year, after this uh, attacks on politician accounts, uh, the state announced that it will be reformed and will be significantly um, powered by new hires. So they say they will be hiring about 1,500 people through the next couple of years, uh, promising to pay good salaries, like up to $4,000 net, which is good salary for Polish market. Uh, but the reality in the same, I mean, news are promising, but the reality in the same time, in the very single moment that they announce it, you see this uh, job description, uh, which says uh, the salary, which, which is uh, gross, is less than $1,000. So absolutely not mentioned the reality. It's not for cyber police, it's for some cyber department of one of the institutions, but nonetheless, the level of current payment, it's not, not comparable with the market. Also, there's this screenshot of the uh, uh, investigation results, which were kind of masked. I mean, the sensitive information is masked, but when you download this PDF, it's just additional layer. You just remove it and you have all the sensitive data, uh, which actually uh, was pretty unfavorable for the for their investigation because of the sensitive context. And lastly, this news about the cyber police, it got uh, pushed for some fraud. Uh, but people started getting mails and it was saying, you are um, recruited, you've been recruited to cyber force. Please click this link and fulfill out your information. So even the good news raised the bad uh, you know, emotions about it because of this uh, potential fraud. But, I mean, fraud was real potential to you because a lot of people got this information. Uh, and also I wanted in the end provide a couple of statistics because we've uh, talked through the particular incidents, but uh, what's on the bigger scale? On the bigger scale, the statistics I could find, one is the checkpoint stats. Uh, here, it's interesting that, uh, of course, it's not the attacks, it's more of malware, right? Malware can, can or cannot cause an attack, real attack. But the interesting that the current countries of origin of the malware files, you see that uh, the most of it is the United States and other countries, but not Russia. In Poland, a lot of people due to, as I mentioned, the uh, geopolitics preferences or tastes attribute things to Russia, even not thinking about it. Uh, of course, this is territory of, of the servers uh, from which the file comes, not the actors behind it. But still, my, my opinion that uh, attribution to Russia is a bit exaggerated of everything I mean, yeah, what's happening in Poland. In terms of type of malware, you see here the comparison to global uh, trend. You see the botnets, for example. And by the way, uh, check, Checkpoint doesn't have a separate category of ransom, and ransom is sitting in botnet category. So it means that probably Poland is more prone to, to ransom than on average with the global market. Um, and also statistics on crime uh, and uh, crime being revealed and the incidents. On the left side, the statistics from police, number of uh, prosecutions and successful uh, prosecutions on top, uh, which, which are cyber crimes on the bottom, which are somehow related to cyber crimes. You see this uh, increase in the recent couple of years. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, level of them being revealed uh, or uh, investigated doesn't increase on the decline. There's also a, a difficulty with the, um, starting the prosecution. You know that for something to be a crime, there should be a victim, a motive, the economic uh, benefit of it, and actually a claim. So usually someone has to, to claim the, uh, the crime, which not uh, the case uh, always for cybercrime, because sometimes it's not possible to gather all of these indications of cybercrime. And also Polish law, if you do a significant cybercrime, probably will get a couple of years. If you do a small robbery, you will get up to 10 years. So again, it's not yet balanced for, for the new reality. In terms of incidents, there are three certs uh, under different lines of uh, verticals of, of authorities. In Poland, I have uh, managed to find only uh, statistics for two of them. Uh, probably a third one has something similar. And the trend is that the number of incidents um, reported is significantly bigger in the recent years. And the answer why is that is significantly in the uh, bottom chart, because the incidents that are uh, proven to be incidents, are uh, their number is much lower than the uh, claims. So probably it's the effect of GDPR that companies now have to report the incidents. And previously they didn't do it. And on the, but, but, but the number of uh, real incidents also is significantly grows like twice uh, in 2020 compared to 2019. And of course, it's uh, partially due to 
the pandemic times and remote work. And on the right, I are excerpt from a KPMG investigation or survey, I would say. It's interesting that number of companies that claim they don't have any incidents it getting lower. So a lot of more companies actually realized they had an incident. And the, the portion of the companies that had more than one incident goes as well. So you see it's like four to nine or one to three incidents. One to three is, actually doesn't grow, but four to nine and 10 to 29. So numerous incidents, the portion of companies that acknowledge this uh, grows. Uh, from one side, maybe it's a good thing, maybe monitoring uh, maturity just grew. From the other side, well, of course, it kind of um, disappoints that there are conditions for such race. And uh, yeah, probably uh, there's a time for conclusion. And I, when I was thinking about conclusion, I thought I could do it in two different dimensions. One is try to compare Poland with the global trends. Unfortunately, I'm not a researcher as such, so I don't probably am not too knowledgeable about all global trends. Uh, in my personal opinion, if we compare uh, Poland in these three layers, at state la layer, although the situation is pretty you know, understandable, the maturity of state services uh, in terms of security is not good, but there was no real uh, impact um, to, from attacks on the state level. So no elections were impacted, no critical infrastructure attacked. But probably Poland is just not the main target in the global world at the moment. Probably you know, attention is somewhere else. A business sector to me it looks pretty average, so struggling with ransom and other type of of of, of, of tax, uh, data leakages, and on personal layer to me it seems that Poland is more prone to such frauds. Probably one reason that could be, and I discussed with colleagues, is that um, the level of con consumer services is pretty good. Uh, you can pay with different uh, methods. There are a lot of fintech startups. There are a lot of online shopping and so on. Of course, it's all useful, but this uh, uh, variety of uh, you know ways how to pay money it means also a variety how to lose money or how to steal money. Uh, so that may be one of the reasons why the uh, level of personal level fraud is actually, in my opinion, bigger than uh, in some other countries. The second dimension of conclusion could be if you are, are in this environment, if you are in Poland as an actor, probably as a private individual or a company, what this means to you? And because Poland, as we just agreed, is probably more or less the same as in the, the global trend, probably the conclusion is the same for, for, for any other country. Uh, my recommendation would be everything that is external to you, wherever you put your data to, and it's controlled externally, just assume it's, it, it's leaked, right? So don't uh, uh, play, put hopes that it will be in secret and build your strategy from, from, from there. So just uh, understand that uh, you have to uh, somehow mitigate leakage of this data. You provide your uh, card number, don't keep all your funds there. You provide your PESL, you have to understand that it's all kind of known to, uh, sooner or later and so on. And to, uh, when, when, when we would talk about something that you control, you have to learn how to protect your assets. So this way of thinking that I'm too small to be attacked, it doesn't work. Even if you will not be attacked by a ghostwriter, I mean, not targeted uh, attack, you'll still probably catch malware or some automation attack, automated attack. So you have to learn how to swim or you resync. So it's kind of the slide is trying to tell you. Sync or swim. And uh, whether you will swim, it depends on you. Um, I think that's all I wanted to tell you, at least uh, as part of presentation. Again, my, my contacts, how you can reach me uh, at LinkedIn or uh, through email. And I'm pretty open, as I already mentioned. If you have any need for information about Poland, feel free to reach out to me. And uh, yeah, if I'm not uh, disconnected and you're still with me, uh, then probably I'm ready for the Q&As, if there's any. I was not following uh, the questions through the presentation. So Vlad, I need your help here, if there are any questions. I see one question for sure. Let's... Uh switch to faces mode yep yeah mm -hmm. cool so so thank you thank you for this presentation i was following through which is rare <laughs> when you uh do a conference so uh it's all very interesting and i will join course who was asking in chat 
uh, whether you are going to submit this to somewhere when you can present uh, the same material in Ukrainian, because course finds this very interesting to Ukrainian speaking audience, uh, especially concerning government identification, government apps, and uh, par parallels drawn with the uh, DIA for sure. Uh, so, do you plan to scale <laughs> to other languages, in particular Ukrainian? Well, of course, for me, no issue to, to do this presentation in Ukrainian or, or Russian, uh, whatever is needed. I don't have any particular plans to submit it for, for, for an event, but of course, if you have any idea where this could be useful, I'm all uh, up to it because oh, the more use we can, we can get out of already spent effort and I already prepared this presentation, of course, it will be better for, for, Good. for, for everyone, Good. right? I hope we will have some suggestions. At least we have uh, a last cave already planned uh, this fall, yeah? As usually, a quarterly held meetup. So, yeah, do we have any other questions? Do you have any other questions? I understand that first speech after lunch is usually a speech when everyone still is kind of napping. So maybe not the right time. There, but... there are two kinds of talks, you know. <laughs> uh, once that outline the topic uh, in its uh, complete entirety and there will be no questions. And the one that uh, provokes some thinking and uh, maybe there are some uh, intended gaps to lure audience into some dialogue and communication. But as it was like a description of uh, historic events and uh, it wasn't biased at all. You announced it in the beginning, but basically it was quite factual and uh, everything was quite factually correct. And there is data behind all this. So yeah, uh, I think there might be no questions at all, but normally we have a couple of minutes when people come up with questions after talks. One question I wanted to put as a point for debates in a couple of hours, but actually I can, I can burn it. <laughs> for your Q&A. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because you touched the topic. Uh, just a little bit of background. So I am thinking currently a lot about uh, the political situation, the global trend of uh, like liberal democracy. And uh, as you mentioned, Poland and uh, many other countries actually, uh, not not only Poland, even in the EU, are currently moving, uh, not, not moving, but slightly leaning uh, to the right and uh, becoming less liberal democracies, I would say. So I wouldn't call them like not democratic or totalitarian countries, but if you look at what's happening uh, politically in Romania, Hungary, Poland, you cannot, you cannot just help but notice yeah, that there is some right-leaning thinking yeah not like in the us <laughs> during trump but still so uh you mentioned that um, and one of the ways liberal democracy can actually survive uh, this trend is uh, mandatory election you know so this is brought up a lot like in the so-called intellectual dark web there are going uh, extensive debates about whether we should or should not mandate uh, participation in uh, election. Yeah, and you mentioned um, mandatory participation in a census, which is basically like operationally it's the same. Yeah, just not expressing your will, but you provide your factual data, hopefully factual data, and. Uh, Mandating anything like this, for me, it's basically the same. Yeah, like in terms of execution. So uh, 
what do you think? Like maybe for the census, it's an overkill, but for a democratic process, would the risk in, in your fair assessment, yeah, would the risk be worth it? Because for census, I don't know, I doubt it. And from your presentation, I guess you doubt it too. But if uh, higher matters are at stake, like our democracy, <laughs> would it would it be enough uh, to to accept the risk and go for it? Actually, interesting. Uh, in, interestingly enough, a book that I just uh, finished reading recently. Uh, the plot is about the country. Well, this actually a Portuguese writer, so it's kind of Portugal, but it's not named. And uh, the citizens of the capital, they refused to vote. So the elections failed, and even the uh, you know, national uh, emergency state was proclaimed because, well, there was this uh, situation that the elections just cannot happen. And the, the government tried to you know, somehow force people to do it. Um, it. It didn't happen. I mean, in the book, it, it failed. So in reality, probably this trying to force would, would also fail but it's my personal opinion luckily i'm not a politician to decide on this uh if i would decide i'd rather go a different way and i limit i, I would do some discrimination um, about who can vote <laughs> honestly speaking because this uh, mo movement which we <laughs> you, you, you live in poland for too long <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, well, finally this... enough I, I have similar thoughts <laughs> maybe it's it's too like right leading but yeah <laughs> yeah I, I actually i have no voting right in poland so for me it's easy you know, to, to to discuss the things because it has no consequences but anyway i would actually link the uh, right to vote not to just citizenship but to some act to play, play an active role in the society for example tax pay, being a taxpayer so if you are retired and you don't pay taxes anymore, you don't vote anymore. And in this way, probably uh, the elections would be more forward-looking than the nostal nostalgic-looking. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, but just, maybe. One, but, uh, just an, an idea which I'm pretty sure will never happen because the discrimination is just like a... Uh, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, like a nightmare for a politician because everyone will accuse any anyone with such idea, and uh, probably the career of a politician will be over at this point. Even though I, I do think... times change, though maybe some sometime this idea will be progressive, but I think that it would be more realistic to uh, just define discriminate not the right to vote, but uh, but the issues that uh, uh, can be resolved through voting, you know, because obviously we cannot vote on uh, tax policy. <laughs> there cannot be a direct vote on tax policy because it's it's silly, okay? People are not educated enough to, to decide whether they will or will not pay certain taxes. It should be decided uh, somehow by experts and people just can decide what experts will decide, what experts will decide, which ones, I mean. Uh, but uh, yeah, most probably we will we will move in that direction, and there will be a lot of political experimentation in the coming years. Unfortunately, with the such trend that we have, we will quicker be in a situation where elections will not be held at all. I mean, some authoritarian approach to government because yeah, yeah we will fail to to solve this issue quick enough. Um, but who knows? Maybe I'm too pessimistic. <laughs> No one, no one knows, uh, but the time will tell. This is, this is what it always does. Uh, the, 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 the reason why I am so interested in this and I'm uh, inquiring your opinion, because uh, when you demand something from the population, you basically need to provide means for that to happen, right? You cannot mandate election unless you, uh, you provide convenience. Uh, if they have to stand up and go somewhere, it's already inconvenient. So that's why uh, if it's mandatory, it should be so easy that everyone can do it basically by applying Touch ID to some digital signature in their phone. And uh, many countries are looking at that right now because otherwise they will not just they, they, maybe mandatory voting will not be needed if it's so convenient and easy maybe the people will just vote because they can and they shouldn't do anything more than touch uh, a button for that but who knows let's wait and see there is I some cheering uh, 
Nice to say it's a very interesting talk. Thank you, Andre. And uh, I think uh, we have something in Q&A. Let's address that. Do you know if CERT cyber police uh, from Poland and Ukraine are cooperating? Do they have something different in cybercrime types that they are investigating? A good question. I haven't seen any news about cooperation of cyber police. I have seen some use of cooperation of usual police, and even this was this case when the uh, a former minister in Poland, who then was the head of, I think, head of Ukrainian was uh, imprisoned. But that was a regular crime. For the cyber cyber crime, I haven't seen this cooperation. And moreover, I think the level of enforcement in cyber area is pretty different. You've seen statistics about Poland, so thousands of crimes uh, like uh, uh, really been investigated. I don't think that in Ukraine we have such level of law enforcement in cyber area. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe time changed, but the last time I've actually seen or was interest, uh, interested in this topic, I think there were only a few cases who ever reaching the courts in the cyber area. So maybe I'm not a lawyer, but I have many friends who would Agree with you. <laughs> uh, okay, Peter is referring to some Europol data. Yeah, there is some partnership, maybe, but yeah, it's yeah, for, uh, formal partnership for sure. I, I think Ukraine and Poland have uh, there are memorandums. Yeah, claim, claim partnerships in different areas. But the question I think was rather about real cooperation. So no, no evidence in the news at least that it's happening. Mm -hmm. Not publicly. I think I think if it's driven by someone uh, as powerful as uh, I don't know FBI, uh, there would be some global cooperation. For instance, if there is a network that is uh, being synchronously arrested in both Poland and Ukraine, <laughs> there would be cooperation for sure. But directly, well, um, by the way, with this ghost writer, the, there was a cooperation. Poland actually went for help to to NATO uh, mm -hmm. about this uh, attack. And I know that also through influence on political channels, the Telegram channel, which posted information from Dvorak email account actually was blocked. Although it popped up under a different name and with a Russian speaking audience in, in, in Russia. For but sure. This is the other <laughs> topic. But I mean, there's, yeah, when it's needed, there is cooperation. But in this case, Poland went to the United States for help, not to Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's it's easier, but the threshold is high. I agree. So I think uh, that's it for the Q&A. Thank you very much once again for this uh, course through recent events in Polish cyber scene, uh, both legal and illegal. It was <laughs> quite educating for me. Thank you very much. And uh, we hope to see it uh, again in Ukrainian uh, somewhere around. Yeah, thank you everyone as well, and uh, have have a good continuation of the conference.